Good news everybody, I've managed to get to a car event for the first time this year and it's not down south. It means I only have to basically drive about 10 miles to get to this place instead of doing a 600 mile round trip. That's brilliant, but it does of course mean that I'm doing it in North Yorkshire and well, it's raining. The wind has died down a little bit, but gale force is basically what we've had overnight. But I'm not here to talk about the weather on North Yorkshire, I'm here to talk about this, the Mazda MX-30. Now, the MX-30 is defining opinion quite a lot in the car and EV community. Its range at roughly 110 miles in the real world, more in uh, summer, less in winter, is not good enough for a lot of people. They say, whoa, 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 I'm not even going to carry on watching this video, it's too low. Mazda have done that for a specific purpose and it may work. I'll explain more later on in the video, but for me, this has got an ace up its sleeve. Something that's not out yet and we don't know exactly when it's coming out, maybe in the next year, but it could be a genius master truck by Mazda. Now, what I mean by that is that, yes, this is a full electric vehicle that can rapid charge at 50 kilowatts uh, or up to, and uh, it will only do about 110 miles. So you're not gonna be probably taking this on long journeys. You're not gonna be using it as your only car. However, there is a range extender version coming out of this, which I think is brilliant. I mean, the BMW i3 is the only other car that ever did this as a range extender. It's effectively the correct way of doing a hybrid. If you accept the fact that for the next, I don't know, five years or so, we're going to need hybrids just for a while, then the best way of doing it isn't the way that most manufacturers do, where you have a big engine, small battery. It's when you have a big battery, small engine, which isn't connected to the wheels. It just generates electricity. That's all it does. It's efficient, it's barely used. I mean, if you talk to an i3 owner, they will tell you that they've probably used their range extender two, maybe three times in that year. Because how often do you go above 100 miles? And if you do, well, you've got the range extender. If you get to a charger, it's not working, you go to the next one. If there's a queue, you go to the next one. If you're 10 miles from home and you think, well, it doesn't matter, I'll just rely on the range extender for that last bit. My parents could get this car even though they don't have off-road parking and there's only four, I think, fast chargers in their town because they have access to some charging but not reliable charging. So most of their journeys will be electric in this, but if something happened and they couldn't charge, then the range extender is where it comes in play. And because of that 100, 110 mile range, you will barely rely on it for the most part anyway. It is a small YouTube part and I'll talk about this later on in the video, but ultimately I think that's where this is gonna make the most sense in the range extender version of it. But it's a full electric version as of now, and it will work for some people just like the Mini and the Honda E does. So let's take a look around the outside, then the inside, I'll take it for a spin. It's, uh, as I said, not very really great weather, and I ain't got a lot of time, so I'm gonna to have to rush through it, I'm afraid. Right, from the front, it's definitely a Mazda family look, isn't it? Uh, it kind of looks like the CX-30, which is the petrol equivalent of this thing. Uh, this bit here though, I do really like this, it's kind of in front of the bonnet but it's got almost a negative void space behind it which if I come to this angle, it shows it off a bit better. I really like that, I really like the fact it's got something a bit different, a bit interesting. Again, other than the bit I've just shown you, it's fairly plain, it's just a kind of slab of plastic at the front. You've got this chunky black plastic at the bottom which goes all around the side, I'll show you in a second. I don't mind this, it is a little bit like every other compact crossover SUV on the road in terms of most of us won't really know what we're looking at. Now from the side, it's clearly got a kind of coupe look, it says Mazda there, I don't know if you can see it because of the rain, of course we're in North Yorkshire, of course it's going to rain. You have the charging flap here, you have these massive chunky bits of plastic all along the bottom and it's really really deep all the way to the front, it gives you kind of an off-road-ish appearance even though it's front wheel drive and it's not an off-road car at all. It's a compact SUV and apparently that's what everyone is buying in the world, SUVs. I personally prefer other types of cars, an estate for example, as opposed to an SUV, but yeah, who am I to say what the world should buy? Now, the party piece and something that is unnecessary but I think is quite cool is the doors. Something I've never really said before, but look, we have a door here. Look, it's practically a right angle to the rest of the car, which, I mean, I suppose if you're a disabled driver and you have to get in somehow, I don't know if that's gonna be a, a good feature for you, but 
really wide open in here, and that's because it's effectively a suicide door arrangement, as they often call it, like the RX-8, I suppose. It's a Mazda thing. Now, in some ways, that's quite good. But in other ways, not so much. <laughs> I'll keep going. This front door has to be opened before the rear door can be opened. That doesn't really bother me so much because how often does the back passenger get out without you getting out as well? It does happen occasionally, but not to the point where it really bothers me really. Certainly if you've got kids in the back, you're going to be getting out before them. However, the one thing which I do not like really, and I would worry about if I own this car, is that if I just open that second, let's imagine you've got out of the car and let someone out in the back. You've just opened your door and they've, they've got out. So you're just waiting for the, to them to do their thing, or you've got a small child here. This rear door can still shut when this is closed, which means it could severely impact this door. I mean, that could do some fair damage if the wind takes it and it goes bang on the outside of it. So I'm not sure about that at all, but you know what? I could live with it, you get used to it. I mean, if I open the other doors through there, you have perfect straight line to the other side. I mean, this is going to be a great car for snipers. Pew! The rear entry as well, not the best. If you've got any sort of accessibility requirements, it might be a bit tough for you. Yeah. It's not that difficult, but it's not easy either. And that's, that's as wide as it goes. And when you shut this, you can't really see anything out because of the tiny windows. <laughs> I'll show you the interior in a second, but yeah, that's one of those features like a lot of cars have. Like the Honda E has a big screen with a fish tank in it. It's unnecessary, but you know what? I like that. It's a little detail which doesn't need to be there, but gives me something. It's a talking point. That's the best thing to say about it, I suppose. So yeah, it's, it's a, it gives it a bit of personality. And I quite like the fact that they've done something different, something that's not just a standard Euro box. The back, again, standard kind of Mazda look. You've got this E Sky Active badge at the back to let you know, of course, it's electric and the MX-30 is electric. There is no petrol variant. Uh, the boot, however, because this is a reasonably sized car. It's a good sized car. Decent sized boot. I would say that that is uh, bigger than most in its class. I mean, it certainly dwarfs the Mini and the uh, Honda E especially the Honda E. Um, let's see what's under here. A few things there, nothing major. Uh, so yeah, overall the boot is actually what I call a near family size boot. It's pretty good actually. The rest of the car at the back is just lots of black plastic. Uh, it's, it's fairly unobtrusive, inoffensive. I don't think you'd really spot it from afar and go, look, it's a Mazda MX-30. But you get my point, it, it, you know, if you were driving behind this on the motorway, you wouldn't really notice it in any way it's just like a lot of other ev uh, a lot of other suvs not evs on the road although there are some nice little details i like what they've done with the lights again here it's just uh it's just different it's interesting at least they've tried a bit on at least some of the car so yeah not everybody will like the massive black chunky plastic around the top the two-tone paint on the roof of course um, and this is a top spec car, so it might look slightly different, of course, depending on which version you're looking at. Okay, let's have a look on the inside of my sanitized car. This is going to divide opinion on some bits as well, I believe, but let's get in. Okay, now, from the inside we have the Mazda steering wheel, which most people will be familiar with. I quite like the feel of this. It does feel very nice. You've got some nice buttons here, easy to use. Yeah, yeah, good feedback. Let me turn the car on and then you get a digital display with two analog displays either side. Let me just turn the radio off for you there. Now, I personally prefer numbers for my speed as opposed to a needle approach. And if I press that button on the steering wheel, you've got that. You can put it up there. So you've got a choice, which is good. I like that. Uh, now, around the cabin, obviously this is the top spec, so not everything will be identical. You're not gonna get the Bose sound system, for example, uh, on the lower end models. This is uh, recycled bottle tops, I believe. Uh, so yeah, it feels all right. It feels quite soft. This is uh, it's softish. It's not too bad. I think that quite like the feel of that leather, of course, or rather vegan leather, or as the rest of the world calls it, plastic. Uh, but yeah, it feels nice. It's kind of like your Tesla. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. This cork. Uh, the rest of it is kind of you know standard switch gear. Really nice, uh, good solid feel to it. The vents again, nice and solid. Dashboard, that soft touch. 
that's kind of hard, but it looks like the soft touch parts. So you're never really going to notice it, are you? Because you don't touch up there. Uh, so yeah, these bits here, nice and compressible. I do like that. Very, very solid build. Again, these are nice and solid. They're not loose or anything. Good air vents. Uh, a bit of a strange one here. Now this display is just for the climate control. So I can change the temperature like that. But I can also change the temperature here. I can change the fan speed here and here. Basically they've duplicated the buttons for that there and for that there. So I'm not entirely sure why they've done that. Why have I got a digital version of a button that's there? That's a bit of a strange one, but there you go. Uh, sat nav infotainment system uh, all up here. Very easy to use. I like that a lot. Uh, it's not touchscreen though, because it's quite far away. So that would be quite a bit of a pain. Uh, it's all done by this thing here. It's like an iDrive almost. So if I press that button, you can then cycle through various things, communication, entertainment. Uh, it does Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well. So I, you know, I really prefer this. I really like the iDrive system, which this sort of uses the similar approach to. Uh, so yeah, I do prefer that because you can do it without having to take your eyes off the road too much anyway. Um, and it, it's nice and responsive. This of course is your gear selector. What you do is you move it to the left and then you can put it in drive or reverse. And then you, you go back and it goes into park. Electronic handbrake, of course, um, and that's your uh, audio control, so volume and various other stuff like that. This bit here, it feels nice, don't get me wrong, I, I, I think this is uh, you know, a nice little console in terms of feel. This is probably going to scratch quite easily though, um, at least not black gloss, so that's a bonus. Uh, something I really do not like. Now, let me just get the key out of the way for you, there, that's the key. Two cup holders there, which is nice, but watch this, I can flick these down. And then all of a sudden you've got somewhere to put your phone, which is quite cool. If you lift that up, of course, then you've got the cup holders again. So if you're not thirsty and you want somewhere to put your phone, you're in luck. If I lift this up here, you've got a bit of close storage. That's very, very deep. It goes all the way down there. So you can fit a load of junk in that. And again, that flicks down there. So you could use that as something. I'm not sure what if you've got a drink where you're going to put your phone though. You've got a lot of storage down here to put, again, more of your crap and your junk that your kids no doubt end up giving you. Um, now, let me talk about this material, the cork. This is an environmental choice in part because it's cork. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very environmental thing. It's hard wearing. It does make me want to pin badges to it though because that's, that's what I kind of think of when I see that. But it's done for a reason. Again, it's not just environmental. Mazda started off by manufacturing cork back in the 1920s, I believe it was. So, you know what, it, it's it's... There's a reason it's there. I don't mind that. I don't think everyone's going to like it, if I'm perfectly honest with you. It does, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it does look a little bit 70s for me, but it's there for a reason and it's a bit different. They're trying something new. I don't mind that. Let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, the seats, again, you've got a lot of environmental materials going on, a lot of uh, vegan slash plastic leather. Uh, they're comfortable. I'm in a comfortable position. Uh, standard seats, really. There's nothing special or bad about them. Uh, materials feel nice, but remember, this is a top spec car. The glove box. It's a full glove box. Yay! Is anybody French or German watching this? We've got a full glove box. Not half of it isn't missing because ugh, of the fuse box or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a interesting design. Right. So I'm getting out of the front. Very wide door opening. And then going to open this. And uh, obviously you wouldn't normally be holding a camera when you get into a car, but <clears throat> it's a bit of a squeeze. Now you can, of course, push this seat forward. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to do what I've just done. You can, you can, you know, it will push forward. Do you know like a, a normal two door car would or a three door car would? So I'm not sure why they've put the door on when you still need to push the car forward. Uh, this, this is for a six footer, this, this position of this seat. Uh, I've got a bit of space. I've not got a huge amount, if I'm honest, but enough. Uh, you've got a little hump there, which uh, I guess is remnants of the fact that this is not a ground up EV. Uh, there's no USB ports that I can see, but you know what? It's not bad in here. It's mainly for kids, if I'm honest, but you would be able to do short journeys, no problems with adults as well. The front is spacious, the back less so. Now the windows. It is a little bit like a submarine in here because they're very, very small. I do that. I, you push the door in, a, in an opposite way to that you're looking at. Uh, and I can shut that as well. Okay, so uh, that's the interior. Let's take it out for a drive now uh, before the weather gets too bad. Eh? 
I think before I actually start driving, let me talk about the elephant in the room that is with this car, the range. Now, I'm more on Mazda's side of this than the people that are going, it's not good enough for a car that's released in 2021. They've done this for a purpose. They've said, this is why we have chosen to do it like this. It's not a compromise. We've chosen to put a small battery like this in it. It's got just over a 35 and a half kilowatt hour battery in total. And the range I would say in the real world is about 110 miles, more in summer, less in winter. Now, again, compared to other EVs on the market, that's very low. Apart from the Honda E and the Mini, of course, which is about the same. There's a little a bit of environmentalism going on here. They're basically saying the smaller the battery, the much smaller the environmental impact to make the car. So the, uh, the break-even point by driving around on electric instead of petrol is much sooner. It's a more environmental machine. But, of course, it does restrict the usage profile somewhat. And they actually said in the uh, little presentation I've just sit through that uh, it, it's, it would be a good second car. But I think they've missed a trick there. For me, anybody who has more than one car in their household, me for example, uh, we have a petrol car, we have an electric car. The electric one, because it is so cheap to run, is the primary car. You may get it as a second one, but ultimately that is the one that will get all the miles. Because ultimately it's very cheap to use. Petrol engine car turns into something that just sits there unless you want to go on a long journey and don't want the hassle of rapid charging somewhere. So when someone says, well, this is a second car, it's a very expensive second car. Actually, no, this is probably the primary one. As I said, the petrol car will be the one that will sit there because for commuting, general driving, you know, got the shops and back, EVs are far better and nicer to drive. They're smoother, they're more refined. So yes, it does restrict the profile somewhat by saying, okay, it's kind of for people that have more than one car in the household, that have another car to rely on. And I think I have to say that you kind of restrict it as well to people that can charge at home. So if you don't have another car in your household or you can't charge at home, you're probably not going to be looking at this car. Now, another reason that they've said they've put a smaller battery in is for handling purposes, to make it uh, a driver-focused ride and and a machine that's around the driver as opposed to just a standard, you know, get you from A to B car, which a lot of cars these days are. And you know what? I kind of get that. Mini have done the exact same. They put a smaller battery in, or rather as big a battery as they could do without changing what it was to be a Mini in terms of the weight would have changed the car completely. The Mini is a agile hatch that people love to drive it's, it's brilliant i've got one myself it's a fantastic car stick a ton of batteries in it to give it a 200 mile range it changes it completely it's then an electric car in the shape of a mini so with this i can see where they're going on that one if we put loads of batteries in it it will change the way it rides it won't be as driver focused as we want it to be at the current level of technology we've got i mean i had a 24 kilo hour leaf a 30 kilo hour leaf both which did less miles than this the 24 a fair bit less miles than this and i still somehow managed to do nearly 20,000 miles a year in it so it, it will sell it will appeal to a certain part of the market just like the honda e does just like the mini electric does they're selling well you know what in terms of ride i think this is better than all of them, apart from the Mini. Maybe a little bit of the Honda E as well. Now, this is highlighting as I'm about to pull out now. The rear quarter is terrible, really hard to see. Now, in terms of the handling, I have to say, it is a lot more driver focused than a lot of the cars I just mentioned. The Zoe, the E208, the Corsa, they're all very safe, very light, town driving type cars, which a lot of people want. This has very direct steering. It's actually really good. It's a bit lighter than I personally prefer. I want a little bit more weight there. But you know what? This does actually feel fun to drive. <laughs> I'm having a good time around these beautiful North Yorkshire roads. That noise, oh, a little bit of talk steer weirdly there. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's the noise it puts on when you accelerate. But you know what? I like, not because I like the noise, it's all right, I, quite, <laughs> I do quite like it, if I'm honest, but it gives you feedback. EVs do kind of like that a little bit, don't they? The feedback in terms of, you know, audio feedback. When you put your foot down in a petrol car, 
certainly one that you've had a while, you know how fast you're going, what the engine is doing just by listening to it, it's subconscious. Mm -hmm. That gives you a little bit of that because it, it gives you a, a more growly noise, you know, it gets louder the more you put your foot down, the more torque the motor is putting through the front wheels. So I quite like the fact it's giving you some feedback as opposed to just silence. It's not quick. I mean, not 60s, just under 10 seconds. Not to 30 is pretty good, actually. The torsion rear beam suspension does mean that over these kind of uneven undulating roads, which in North Yorkshire is all of them, it, it does get a little upset when you start to push it, but not in a dangerous way. It's actually fun to drive. Like I said, it's, it's way better than the Corsas and the Peugeots and the Zoe's. It's not as nice, uh, or as engaging, should I say, to drive as the Mini is, the Mini Electric. That's the party piece of the Mini, isn't it, though, at the end of the day. The price of this starts at just over £25,500. That's after the government grant. The launch edition will be 27 and a bit, I think. And it will go up to just over £30,000. So you're looking at the sort of same price bracket as, what, Honda E and Mini Electric, effectively, uh, in terms of list price, anyway. It's sort of in the same ballpark as your Corsas and your Zoe's and your E208s as well. So it's got some stiff competition and I think that's this car's biggest problem. I personally would compare this to the Mini and the Honda e more. It's more of a city car is this, predominantly because of its range, even though it is a, a bigger SUV style. I mean, once you accept the fact that this isn't a long range EV, I think most people will like it. It's interesting, it's slightly different in parts, it's really well built, well specced, it's competitively priced. It just always comes back to that range, which again, the range extender will completely eliminate. Now I'm not suggesting people get this and rely on the range extender, that would be silly. But getting this instead of a, a traditional hybrid, if you cannot at yet, you know, yet own a full electric vehicle, hmm. Again, I think that's where this will come into its own. It is a comfortable place to be. It's a really refined drive. It's nice and quiet. Now I've got used to it, I quite actually like that audio feedback. That's easy to read. This is easy to use without, you know, I can carry on driving and adjust things without having to do this, like you do with a lot of touchscreen based stuff. So there's a lot they've got right with the uh, Mazda. There's a lot of I won't say got wrong, but taking a gamble on, and it is a gamble. Let's face it, a lot of people, certainly those that are unfamiliar with EVs, will just look at the range and that's it. They won't even bother going to the dealership. But you know what? As I said, as Mazda said, in fact, if you are looking at a, a, another car in your household, it's not just going to be your only car. If you can charge at home, I think this is one to put on the list. I mean, let's face it, 25 and a half grand list price. I'm assuming there will be discounts on that eventually. That's going to be on the cheaper end of the EV market. The Kia Soul, just to come back to the batteries a second. That, uh, well, in the UK in a way, that comes with a 64 kilowatt hour battery. It's got really incredible range. It, it, it's a very good car. I, I'm, not, I'm not knocking the car at all. But it costs nearly 35,000 pounds. This is 10,000 pound cheaper. That's the compromise between putting a good range in and uh, an average range in. How often will you do more than 100, 100, 110 miles in a day? If it's very often, you're gonna to have to spend that extra five to 10,000 pounds on a bigger battery version car. At the moment, it won't be forever. For now though, this does, I think, fill a segment, fill a purpose. For what they've produced on their first EV, I actually quite like it, you know. It's got some weird materials, the cork's going to divide opinion. But, it's different, isn't it? It's a talking point. Uh, but thanks for watching, please do like, subscribe, all the usual crap that people mention, because then I can get to more events like this and see new cars. Overall, I'm going to say, you know what, well done Mazda. It's not the perfect car, it's got flaws. No doubt, in the comments section, people will be going, nah, that range is ridiculous. Well, people are still buying the Minis and the Hondas, as I said before. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Get some lunch.